very nice to, to see folks. Thanks for joining our group tonight on uh, this beautiful summer evening. Nice to see some folks enjoying the, the outdoors. <laughs> so we'll get started in just a few seconds here. <clears throat> So I'm just beginning to settle in. We'll have a 30 minute guided meditation and then I'll offer some reflections and then we'll have some time for discussion together. And uh, I have my window open. Just let me know if, if you hear any background noise. Um, Zoom's pretty good about isolating the speaker sound so it should be okay. So just finding a comfortable posture tonight, as comfortable as possible for this 30 minute meditation time. <clears throat> Maybe taking a few deep breaths together to help us arrive here and now, this moment. And maybe one more deep inhalation and exhalation. And then letting the breath continue on its own. And as we settle in, maybe just taking our time and in a way taking the temperature of our mental and physical, emotional state this evening, assessing and having this global awareness, like just like we would be interested in hanging out with a friend, just being interested in a global way. How are you? How's your energy? How's your mood? Are you tired or energized, happy or irritable? Body feeling comfortable or uncomfortable? And not to judge, but just, just to know how it is. If the mind is busy or calm, so just the weather, you could say, the weather of our physical, mental, emotional climate this evening. And maybe there's some room for acceptance, however it is. It's lawful, it's natural, it's nature just the result of causes and conditions. So once we feel like we have some sense of how we are, how, what it feels like to be me right now, then we begin practicing. And one way to think about meditation practice is that we're cultivating wholesome qualities in the mind. Regardless of the conditions of the mind or of the body, they may be pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. But the question as practitioners is, what is a skillful way to relate? What is a skillful view to have? What's a skillful direction 
to aim the mind, where to put our attention, what intentions to cultivate, and our barometer, our measuring stick, is, is this cultivating wholesome qualities in the mind, strengthening them, weakening unwholesome. And wholesome and unwholesome just means leading towards suffering for ourselves and others or away from suffering for ourselves and others. Suffering, stress, agitation. Mindfulness itself is a wholesome quality. We can be curious. What's the difference between being aware and not being aware? What does it feel like to be aware? What does it feel like when we realize that we have not been aware, we've been lost in thought or caught up in some drama? What, why is awareness skillful? Full awareness, embodied, relaxed, present moment, awareness, intimacy with things as they are. What does that allow for? What does that support in terms of skillful qualities? And we may choose to direct the mind towards some aspect of physicality as a useful support for putting aside our thoughts about things, discursive thinking, comparing, judging, planning, evaluating these normal activities that we spend so much time on. But during the meditation time, we we're interested in a non-conceptual, more direct knowing. And we can know thought and know physical experience, but we're knowing them in a certain context from a certain point of view, not in terms of their content so much, but the fact that they're happening here and now and the curiosity, how does this affecting the heart and the body. So orienting towards embodiment, physicality, is a useful grounding, useful mooring post to remind us that it's possible to put aside these deep habits of trying to control things in some way by thinking about them. And that habit will continue on its own, but as a practitioner, we can have another intention, which is maybe something as simple as, is it possible to be aware of breathing in while I'm breathing in and breathing out while I'm breathing out? Is that something the mind can give itself to generously. Or just the sensations of sitting, the posture, the uprightness, cultivating a moment to moment, receiving receptiveness to the different sensations. And as a third option, and of course there are other options, but I'll just offer these three. So one is mindfulness of breathing, two is mindfulness of the sitting posture, the groundedness, and the stability of the posture, the relaxation into the posture, trusting the earth to hold us up, relaxing all the muscles that aren't necessary. And the third option is mindfulness of hearing. 
just the field of hearing and the sounds that arise and pass. This receptive awareness is not clinging to any sound, not pushing away any sound. Just staying relaxed and receptive to this field of hearing. And you may have another meditation object that you are comfortable with and your mind can give itself to. But if not, then maybe see if one of these three appeals to you. Mindfulness of breathing, just knowing breathe, that you're breathing in as you're breathing in, knowing that you're breathing out as you're breathing out. How do you know you're breathing in? What sensations are present? How do you know you're breathing out? And just following that, that gentle flow or mindfulness of sitting, the stability, the strength, the calm, the spaciousness, or mindfulness of hearing, letting go of the need to control and emphasizing receptivity. So I will leave us to our practice following your intuition doing the best you can, letting that be good enough. And we'll sit again, uh, sit together for another uh, 18 minutes.
So for the last minute of the meditation, feel free to practice with your eyes open for a few seconds, letting go of directing the mind towards any particular experience, object, and instead just practicing being right in the middle of our lives without resisting or holding on, abiding peacefully and aware, knowing just what is obvious, what's already being known. Take a minute or two. Thanks for your practice. So feel free to stretch. And uh, in about a minute, I'll begin offering some thoughts. Although maybe uh, I'll channel Shelly for a second here and ask if there's anyone here uh, at the Wednesday night weekly practice group for the first time tonight, if you want to. If you are new and you'd be willing to say hi, but they may not be, or they may be shy, which is okay. And uh, if anyone else would just like to say hi to bring a sense of community to the room, that would be great. Anyone want to say hi? Well, thanks again for being here. Um, yeah, really looking forward to our discussion tonight. So I don't know if some of you saw, but I, I wrote a little blurb for the weekly email this, this week that went out today, um, inviting people to come. So maybe some of you saw that, but if not, um, the plan is to talk about, um, our conditioning as social sexual, tribal mammals, uh, just this part of our lives, um, whether we're, you know, in a intimate relationship or not, um, you know, whether this feels like, uh, yeah, just all the different ways that this shows up in our lives, even a lot of the time, just when we're alone, you know, how, how do we think of ourselves in the social realm? in the sexual realm, in terms of our close relationships and the, the strong attachments that form there. How is how do we think about that? How is that part of our identities? Uh, so there's a lot here and it's there's a lot of different strands. And uh, yeah, for me, I think the first sort of question is, um, what do, you know, well, I mean, on, on the most basic level, as I understand the Buddhist teachings, they're concerned with suffering and the end of suffering. So very pragmatic and compassionate, not dogmatic or idealistic, you know, very earthy, down to earth, Buddha made this point many, many times in many different ways that uh, that what he taught was suffering and the end of suffering. So I just wanted to kind of talk about that for a second to start to kind of maybe orient us a little bit, like, you know, as we explore this part of our lives to some degree together, uh, as I understand it, the the aim is, and my real interest is, what does freedom look like? What does freedom from suffering look like? And what are the ways that we that we do suffer, that we get stressed and um, in this arena? So it's practical and it's compassionate and it's not uh, trying to uh, find some objective truth that everyone should believe or follow, that there's 
one way, the correct way to understand what it means to be a social, sexual, tribal mammal. And uh, I think in, yeah, in, in any area, um, in all areas, this is something the Buddha was really, uh, really careful about and really made this point about the danger of, of attachment to fixed views and the conflicts, interpersonal conflicts, and the intrapersonal suffering and stress and dismay that arises when we cling to a view and others disagree with us and then we have to debate with them and just this whole realm. And I don't think he's saying we shouldn't have views because we need to have views in order to make sense of the world. But in terms of on this really uh, kind of basic fundamental level of looking for peace, um, being interested in peace and freedom from suffering, just pointing out uh, how when we're attached to a view, when we cling to a view, it tends to lead to stress and suffering. So I just wanted to kind of say that up front in order, partly also to put in context what I might offer, which is that I'm very much, you know, this is a really interesting area for me. And I have no sense of um, uh, yeah, it's, 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 I feel like a beginner in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I'm, I don't, I'm not coming here really. I have some points, a few points maybe to make, but then I am really interested in what other people have to share and just kind of exploring together, see what we might learn together. So yeah, just coming with a lot of humility because these forces are really strong forces. Maybe that's a good starting point. You know, and that's maybe, you know, an even broader topic that would include all, you know, the social, sexual realm, but could be even broader is just sort of like, yeah, areas of charge, areas of intensity, and, and how do we understand them and how do we practice with them in terms of mindfulness practice, wisdom practice, compassion practice. Because I think, and I think part of that framing is that we could have the sense that uh, yeah, that somehow these these areas of our life that can feel so intense um, yeah, we can feel like they're maybe not talked about as much or uh, yeah, somehow feel that um, it's not possible to bring the same kind of integrity and commitment to just being aware, to being mindful, to being compassionate, to coming from an open heart um, in the areas where we tend to get, uh, have our conditioning activated in, in ways that can be pretty powerful. Just the, the power and strength of desire and the power and strength of fear that can arise in, in social, sexual uh, relationships, intimate relationships, you know, sexual or not, but places where we, we feel like someone really knows us, really sees us. Uh, all, of, all of us are, are good qualities and are not good qualities. And I think uh, an undercurrent to all of this, or um, you know, in, in the social realm, and, and I think I think to some degree in the sexual realm too, you know, the topic is also desire and what we desire, and part of what we desire, at least, is we could call it love, and. Um, Yeah, and just uh, kind of owning that. So I think a big part of what I've found useful, and maybe I'll, I'll start just offering a really basic frame that I think for all these areas is a useful one. Uh, 
which will not be new to anyone who's who's been around common ground even for for a little bit and that's the framing that whatever all of this stuff is that can be so powerful that can really kind of take feel like it takes us over at times but whatever it is it's nature it's just nature and uh, we could look at that in different ways one way is um, you know bio biologically conditioning that's the product of millennia of evolutionary pressure to produce you know uh, to produce uh, beings that um, want to connect and uh, pass on their genes and all that gets hardwired in in different ways and again we don't have to get into all the details or even you know but but just the broader view that it's nature it's nature you know having being being human having a human body which has all you know anatomy and chemistry that's at play that's at play that's our karma being born in in human bodies however we identify there's there's activity going on that's sort of it's the result it's not it's not something that we created or chose at least consciously <laughs> it's just this is it this is what we're born with this is the package maybe you know we it didn't come with the user manual but we can sort of learn and we can pick stuff up and and we do um but it's nature one way or the other i mean at least that to try that on as a frame well what if this is just nature and and, and from that point of view well, nature can be studied and we can learn about it. We can see how it works, cause and effect. And also, of course, social conditioning. So it's not just, you know, things that are hardwired in, you know, that maybe we have a lot in common with our, you know, even hunter-gatherer ancestors and the kinds of minds that were selected for by evolution to succeed in these intensely social small bands where you know that humans spent most of our lifespan or most of our time evolutionarily speaking you know in these groups um, so intensely social very relational groups so that's that's part of our conditioning and then of course there's the social conditioning of that's more particular more specific growing up in a certain family growing up in a certain country and how all that affects us and you know, with the degree of wisdom and the degree of ignorance there. So just just that appreciation that it's not a blank slate. And uh, it's not even necessarily um, kind of weighted on the side of wisdom. There's just a lot of conditioning. And that's what we feel, I think, if we're honest. It's not like, you know, we just feel. We just feel attraction and, you know, sexual attraction, social attraction, the desire to belong, to fit in, to be liked, to be loved. And to just that frame that it's nature, not self, maybe helps us kind of in a funny way actually own those needs with a little bit more fully, not take them so personally. Like, oh, I'm the only one who wants to be loved. I'm so needy and everyone else seems totally fine. As opposed to just this is so natural the desire to for affection and appreciation attention acceptance allowing so maybe it's not a problem maybe it's just part of the package part of the wiring and that framing that it's nature on the one hand yeah helps us maybe own it a little more like nothing to be embarrassed about or it's just what it is and uh and on the other hand maybe too see that it it's not that personal and uh yeah to kind of see it for what it is as well and i think the the positive effect of that frame can be 
And it's, you know, it's not even that it tells us exactly what to do or how to relate to it all, except that, and this is, I think, really the where, because there's so much wisdom from all different places, you know, in these, in these areas, but what does the Buddhist teaching maybe have to offer specifically? And just this teaching that it's nature, not self, has the potential, I think, it just could make it a little a little less personal so that maybe we have a little bit more space and a little more curiosity whatever it is whether it's a more personal social conditioning or maybe just a more biological conditioning whatever it is that we're a little more willing to see it feel it take responsibility for it because we see it's not personal i didn't choose it it's just like Saidu Tejaniya says, the mind is not yours, but you're responsible for it. So just kind of like with anything, if we bought a dishwasher or something, we would we would read the the user manual. We would want to know how it works. So the same way, we want to study kind of from that naturalist perspective. I have a human body, I have a human mind, human needs. Let's get to know them so that I can take responsibility for them and how I might act them out. And here's the thing. I think from the Buddhist perspective, what's of ultimate import and of the ultimate frame is a little different than what we might think if we're only looking at it from that perspective of human needs, which we have human needs. Um, but that's just nature and the larger Buddhist frame I might suggest is how to be a human with human needs, real human needs in as free and as open hearted, as wise, as skillful, as responsible, as ethical a way as possible. So it's a bit of a shift in refuge or an orientation from a point of view of just being a human animal trying to get our needs met, that is the that's the that's the game. That's the that's the primary motivation. That's what gets us up in the morning. Is I'm a human animal, or I'm a human with human needs, and my, the purpose of my life, the meaning of my life, is to try to get those met as best I can. And and it's sort of like that, seeing that as nature, that that's just what a human is going to do. There's nothing wrong about that. And it's just, I mean, it's just kind of nature playing itself out, just like a tree branches, tree branches will orient towards the sun to try to get their needs met. So to see it as nature. We're just gonna be trying to get our needs met as best as possible. And that's that's just nature playing itself out. And so then from the point of view of our interest in freedom and open heartedness and um, yeah, freedom in all situations, it's a bit of a different frame. It's maybe a subtle point, but in a way it's uh, the ultimate aim then isn't getting my needs met at all costs, but rather how to be, yeah, as free, compassionate as possible, relating with wisdom and compassion to that natural process. And maybe I'll just give an example to kind of illustrate why I think this is an important point. Yeah, I think there basically I think the point is and I, there's a word there's some words in in Buddhism this distinction between worldly and unworldly. So like worldly happiness and unworldly happiness. So worldly happiness is getting our needs met and that's a real kind of happiness, gratification, having good friends, having our sexual needs met, having uh, you know, a safe home. These things are real happinesses that can be appreciated and can be very sustaining and fulfilling. 
and unworldly happiness are more you could say internal sources of happiness that are less dependent on external situations so just that just to whatever degree that we've cultivated our hearts and minds and their understanding of the causes for suffering and causes for happiness that's a more reliable form of happiness um our you know whatever sense we have of integrity and our values and kind of what we will and won't do, what we will and won't put up for, self-respect, um, or whatever degree of confidence we have in the power of metta, of goodwill, as a basic orientation towards ourselves and others, uh, and all the other wholesome qualities that, yeah, are are more independent of of conditions and of course these are related because the more we cultivate skillful qualities the more likely it is that we will have um, relationships that feel fulfilling because we'll be because that tends to support um, affection and trust is being being trustworthy But I think in the in these arenas, yeah, I mean, at least for me, and it's been a helpful reflection, just a bit to kind of make it a bit of a dichotomy, because the force of attraction, whether it's sexual or social, can be so strong. Uh, to sort of have this counterpoint or just this question: What really is the refuge? What really is the heart? really seeking you know because we might think oh yeah you know take like the experience of loneliness well what i want is you know someone to be here to talk to but then we might have a situation where there is someone but we're still we don't feel like we're, we're quite showing up in the way we'd we'd want to or not quite connecting um i read that loneliness scientifically or a way they define it is a gap between the amount of social interaction we have and the amount of social interaction we would like to have so there's no absolute you know someone could be could not feel lonely and, and be alone in a cave for many years but really you know for whatever reason feel quite connected The, the way this kind of uh, became clear to me uh, in the last year was just something I might express it as no matter how much it seems like uh, I want a certain situation, a certain outcome, or a certain relationship, or want someone to like me, or whatever, no matter how strong that is, there's still always, you could say, an ethical component, a way of like, how am I trying to get that need met? And that there's there's ways to try to get that need met that feel more true. Like, like am I, am I um, including my needs in the equation? Or is the force of that desire sort of, like for me, that's a conditioning that I have of kind of putting my desires to one side because that desire to be liked or to be included or whatever is so strong. And like, but then just through experience, through trial and error, just learning like that slight aversion of like, oh, this is the way. If I make myself smaller or whatever in some way, someone will like me. And then even if for a moment or a day or whatever, Someone does like me because I've tried really hard for, for them to like me, but in so doing, you know, wasn't quite aware of unskillful habits that I was reinforcing, that it's not, it's not worth it. Um, so 
it's pretty, that's a pretty, I think, down to earth example, but I think it does point, yeah, just to, yeah, a possibility of relating to this whole arena, um, maybe a little bit differently, where the, again, the primary aim, while it's still an aim that we will always have, of trying to get our needs met as best they can, and it's a worthwhile aim to try to become more skillful in our relationships so that we have more fulfilling, trusting relationships. It's a really, really big, important thing. It's more a question of what, how, how does that actually get set in motion? And is it through just, um, yeah, basically it's, I think the point I'm trying to make is these very same kind of teachings, which can feel sort of maybe idealistic or something like goodwill or mindfulness and wisdom and discerning skillful and unskillful, you know, our intentions behind how we act and speak, that maybe they're actually very practical and very useful. The teachings on metta I've really been exploring over the last year as well. Metta is often translated as loving kindness. But I read a book by Tanisaro Bhikkhu, uh, a monk in, in California, who prefers the translation of goodwill because it's more applicable. Uh, you might not always feel a lot of warmth or loving kindness for someone, but goodwill may be applicable in every situation to have goodwill. Is it ever skillful or useful? It doesn't mean we don't have ill will, but is it ever useful? to have ill will. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be possible to have goodwill w wishing someone well, even if someone's very unskillful, very ignorant, causing harm, but the wishing of the goodwill is, uh, we wish that they would, they would wake up, that they would stop ca causing harm for themselves and others. And I think it can be helpful to kind of, even though metta can feel like, oh, that's that's so basic, but is it? I mean, like in an intimate relationship, in a sexual relationship or whatever, just a close emotional relationship, the people we're, we're closest with, isn't metta the most trustworthy foundation for any other sort of, you know, kind of relationship? And uh, it's it's not, yeah, I think just sort of, yeah, kind of, yeah, seeing that that it's really a protection for our own hearts and, and just it's in a, it, bringing that to mind, the attitude of goodwill can really illuminate all the ways that we might justify ill will, um, even in subtle ways towards ourselves or, or towards others. Especially if our orientation is around is kind of focusing on getting what we want. It's, I mean, it's such a deep lesson. And again, like in these arenas where the desire can be so strong, it can really feel like there's no choice, but, but that's a view. That's, that's a way of looking and it has consequences. So maybe to kind of ground things a little bit, um, in terms of kind of practical, you know, teaching, skillful means, views that may be helpful in this arena. And I think you can divide them into two categories. So from the starting point of having a little bit more space, maybe that this is nature, not really personal, this whole arena, then it's just a question of what's kind of a skillful intervention for ways that we may be clinging to it as personal or taking it personally or attached in ways that are causing us to get tight or um, be unskillful in some way, subtle or, or not subtle. And I think there's basically two ways that this happens in broad strokes. And, and the Buddha talked about this um, and we could summarize it as on the one hand, we cling, you know, just with the intensity of these forces. Um, basically, one orientation is that, which I think I've already talked about, but is like um, 
this is the purpose of life. This is the ultimate purpose of life. So this is this is kind of this is it. This is what a life is about: is maximizing pleasure, good things, um, and so. Yeah, that that's limited. Even the most beautiful friendship, you know, or 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 relationship. Yeah, just seeing how clinging, taking it personally, you know, be, will lead to suffering one way or, or the other at some point. And we don't have to believe that, but we can check it out, you know. Is there really like, you know, we might have these romantic ideals. Is there really <laughs> a person out there, this objective person, that only if we find them, then we'll be happy forever? As opposed to if we found them and even if they were, you know, perfect for us in some way, just a really good match. Wouldn't we still have our conditioning, whatever our conditioning is? And uh, what to whatever degree our conditioning is still kind of um, built on taking things personally, then that then that person sort of gets will become part of that we will take them personally <laughs> and that's that's a sad thing that happens all the time and then we take them personally and then we want them to be the way we 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 want them to be and and then they're not because they're not they're not us and they're not under our control and then we feel betrayed so that's one side we might have this orientation okay that's that's it I'm just going to maximize pleasure, maximize success, happiness. And just to see that that's limited because we only have so much to say. And that just that orientation even in and of itself is stressful because even if we have what we want, get what we want, then we have to hold on to it and defend it, protect it from changing. So there's stress inherent even when things are good. And then the other side is all of this is agitating, stressful to have to have human needs, try to get them met, try to convince people to meet my needs, have to expose my needs, have to be seen in that way. And it's, you know, and it's all impermanent anyways. And so this is the side of repression or denial. Oh, I'm fine. I don't have needs. Um, because it's, because these, because it's hard. Um, and so the Buddha, yeah, talked about this right away. And this is where the phrase, the middle way comes from. That, and what both of those views have in common is taking it personally, that, that life is somehow personally about me trying to get my needs met, that that's sort of what life is about as opposed to, and this is where I think the meaning of middle way isn't just contentment or, or, um, yeah, being content with with little or moderation, like an in between. It's more that both of those views are taking something that's nature personally, and so the real freedom is giving back to nature what's of nature. It's nature that we have needs and try to get them met, and that it and it's nature that they will probably always be met somewhat imperfectly. It's not a betrayal, and it's. And so from that point of view, then we just maybe have compassion. Oh, like what a predicament to be a human being with needs that will always be met somewhat imperfectly and that it takes work to even have good relationships. It takes work, like, it, you know, a lot of work probably. And, but that, but that it's not, yeah, that it's not, Maybe we could be free in the midst of it because what is it that really hurts? It's it's usually when we when it something feels personal in the sense of particular to me. Oh, it's because I'm this way. I'm unlovable, or or I'm so great and no one deserves me, and or I don't know. <laughs> um, 
but one way or the other, both of those, you could maybe sense that both of those have a bit of loneliness in them. This need to define ourselves, to set ourselves apart as if we weren't just another human being. I mean, we all, we're, all, we're all unique for sure, just a particular set of conditions. But what's in the way of this particular set of conditions, this nature, um, being seen and accepted fully as just nature, including the skillful and the unskillful, because we understand that it's, it's just the natural result of causes and conditions. And then from that point of view, of course, we're still interested in, in, in suffering and the end of suffering. And if, and you know, we all want pleasure more than pain. So whatever we could do to have a happier life and to set in, in motion good conditions for ourselves and others, we would do. But we do it because we out of compassion, um, because it's because it's yeah, it's what it's what the heart wants. And less because we're desperately trying to kind of construct a permanent self image one way or the other, that then we'll, we'll feel okay. So a lot of it, I think, yeah, is owning, owning our conditioning, which takes a lot of time and patience and compassion because so much of us have so much conditioning just through culture and, and family But I think the power of the Brahma Viharas, of Metta, in a, in a way, this is where we get some relief from the constant unending conditioning that most of us have of comparing, which is a huge part of all this, comparing ourselves to others, evaluating better than, equal to, worse, and all the suffering there. There's no real peace there, even if we feel like we're better. That's that's stressful too. We, then we have to convince other people that we're better. Someone doesn't think we're better and we feel we have to convince them that we are. But metta, metta sees the good, metta appreciates the good, metta accepts, metta understands. Metta isn't, yeah, it's, we don't have to deserve metta just being a human being, a sensitive human being that feels, that wants to be happy, doesn't want to be happy. So there are these levels like metta and wisdom that can give us some relief and some perspective, which in my experience really seems like the only perspective that really gives a, a more full relief and release from the stress of being in some level or the other, even if we're enjoying it on some level or the other, but the stress of being in the, the social rat race, always needing to prove ourselves one way or the other, even to our to, even to ourselves. But but isn't isn't it available that we could just care that we're a human being that experiences, like all human beings, loss and uncertainty and these human needs, these desires for love and affection that aren't guaranteed. Isn't that enough to open our hearts? And so I think with this, we can start to get maybe a sense of this shift in refuge um, where there might be these this possibility of these transpersonal, bigger than an individual, not about me, not about who I am, not about deserving, not about becoming accomplishments, competence, but just uh, a free gift that, um, that hopefully we receive or we can sense that we receive or we can practice receiving whatever where, and wherever it shows up any amount of kindness that we've received in our life that felt like it was offered as a free gift. Some people just have that, have met to sort of overflowing. 
and they just see you and they just make space for you and they're not yeah you know that psychological phrase phrase unconditional positive regard and we let that in we see how good that feels how it releases something that maybe we weren't even aware we were holding which is that constant need to be deserving to feel like we need to do something to be deserving of love So there are these, uh, yeah, it's one where, the, yeah, it's sort of like, it's still in the, that realm of the conditioned, you know, metta is conditioned, it's conditioned by seeing the good, but it's something that we can cultivate and, and strengthen in ourselves. And all the paramis, these beautiful qualities of mind, metta, patience, equanimity, truthfulness, integrity, generosity, um, determination. You can see how when we, when we appreciate how our heart might light up for some of those, how it, it might feel like a source of strength that's less susceptible to being pushed around and that gives us more skill in navigating everything that it that's involved in being a human being. Um, so somehow for me, there does feel like there is a bit of a shift that can happen, um, where and it's it's not that they are they're mutually exclusive, but if it's if the mind is making them so, like if the mind if my mind sort of like in that example I gave earlier, but if the mind is saying, because I want this so much on the social or sexual tribal level or because I'm so afraid of losing this and those desires and fears can be very strong, maybe the strongest that we experience, but because there's so strong, I feel like I have, I have to somehow compromise on maybe these beautiful qualities of patience or equanimity or metta determination, keeping in mind what's, you know, what we feel is of most highest value. So that's really, I think, uh, one point is, yeah, just kind of seeing, opening our minds to including, including all parts of our life and that they will all function better if to whatever degree where we do have some clarity around this heart, it's not anyone else's heart. It's not because someone likes me or loves me or told me I was good. It's not because I'm in relationship with this person as beautiful as that might be and the source of meaning that I get from that. But this heart through trial and error, through cause and effect, through hard won knowledge has some degree of beauty, of wisdom, of know-how we know, hopefully, if we've been practicing, we know a little better how to take care of ourselves and how to take care of others. And no one can take that away from us. And, you know, we're all on the path. None of us is, I think, <laughs> you know, at the end of our path. But hopefully we could sense in just very simple, earthy ways. Yeah, this is what I've learned is gold. No one could have taught me that. No one can give you that. This is why the point is made so often. You know, no one can be a better friend to us than our own well-trained heart. And it's in that context that I think our relationships function the most skillfully, where we realize that, uh, yeah, and one way I've been thinking about this is if we really own our needs and we understand that no one can understand our needs as best as we can, and that really we're responsible for meeting our needs. And then the people in our lives and the hopefully the wholesome relationships that we cultivate is us compassionately doing our best to meet our needs and engaging with people and and just making those steps towards yeah, I have needs, you have needs, 
maybe we could meet each other's needs. Um, but it's coming from this point of view of becoming more and more skillful at being a human being with needs and being able to dance with that uh, with grace and openness. So I think I'll leave my comments there to see um, what thoughts other people might have. Yeah, what are you learning in this arena? What are What's interesting, what's challenging? Um, or any questions about anything I've shared. Um, and we'll stop the recording now so we can